Hello folks and welcome to our game here this Monday morning with myself Shane Stibbs and joined as ever by Michael Verney here. We're both rigged out in uh, orgoretro.com regalia. If you want to get some of these uh, jerseys, there's a huge amount of jerseys you can get online. 15% off with the promo code our game. By the way, before I let Verney in to start chirping away on this Monday morning, uh, we do have a couple of coaching clinics coming up. Uh, we have one Friday, March the 3rd in Pilltown. That's going to be Richie Power, Park Mahoney and Barry Hennessy. In uh, Valley Rovers then on Saturday, March the 11th, we'll have Pat Ryan, former Limerick forward, Brick Walsh and Michael Fenley. So you can see with huge lineups there and you'll get the link to the tickets in the video description. Young Verney, how's she cutting this morning? You're looking a little bit tired. I'm all right. I had a long, long weekend. We'll get into that earlier. I have only one thing to say to you. Dave, Dave is at the wheel. The Rossies are back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Davey Burke is absolutely flying it, isn't he? Three wins from three and all against very good teams. She's like, it's not a case of, you know, he's in Division 2 and he's playing teams at the lower tier of that. Mm. He's in Division 1. He's beaten Galway. He's beaten Tyrone. And who was the other one? Arma. Arma. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so, serious, you know. Like, you know, you know, we all make predictions about, you know, different things that might happen, like, or whatever, and to start the league. No one would have predicted this, and even the most optimistic Ross Common person wouldn't have predicted it. And I hear some people saying, oh, they must have, you know, front-loaded their fitness to be hit the ground running in the league. But Davey was appointed quite late, like, the Donegal appointment, the Monaghan appointment, and the Ross Common appointment were all quite late. So it's not as if they had like loads of chances to get the like he would have just been still assembling his you know his squad when you know plenty of other squads would have been back doing a bit already. So uh, it's phenomenal, really. Uh, just on on my weekend, I had a long weekend, long weekend. So I was in Edinburgh at a stag. Uh, left Friday afternoon, flew back in yesterday morning a half nine and then got the train down to Cork. Uh, had a nice snooze on the way down. It felt fresh enough. But it's funny enough, do you ever find sometimes, um, I actually just found it was in the zone yesterday for some reason. Everything was happening and it was just working. And then there's other days where you have 10 hours sleep behind you and you're just like, you just can't get moving or whatever. I don't know, it just all worked. It all clicked. <laughs> so you were in a flow state. Isn't that what they it, often yeah, say? Yeah, in the flow yeah. state. I was actually chatting a few boys over there. Uh, there's a stag over there from uh, I think it was a Tyrone stag, and a good few of them are big, uh, big watchers of the show as well. And that, and I was chatting a few. I, I jumped into a taxi from Cork Station uh, out to Parky Cueve yesterday with a few dubs as well. Good old crack. Um, they bring, uh, they just bring a great old atmosphere and vibe to the to anywhere they're traveling to. It was good old, good old crack. Yeah. Well, when the dubs are around, you know, you're bleeding yeah. now. Uh, <laughs> John Collins says, good morning, all. Keep the comments coming in. Great win for a clear camogie team over the All-Ireland Champions yesterday in the first round of the league. Don't mention the football, please, says Grodo, go crack on. We're going to be talking about the top five risks in hurling of the 21st century because, you know, we Christy Ring would be up there, but we probably just haven't seen quite enough of the likes of him and Rackard and all these brilliant players, Jimmy Doyle, so on and so forth. So we're going to do a 21st century only. Get your comments in now on who you think is the best risk in the 21st century. And we'll come back to it in a little while and we'll tell you why we're talking about it. There's so much to talk about. Um, will we start off with Desi Farrell talking about both red cards as soft yesterday down at Parky Cueve? So will you give us the sort of background on it and tell us your own thoughts on it and what Desi said? Yeah, well, there was in a game where I didn't really think there was a bad stroke, there were 10 yellows and then two red cards yesterday. Um, I'd say probably the East referee Seamus Mulhair, who was in the you know really in the in the spotlight maybe for one of the first times in his career maybe didn't cover himself in glory. But Ian McGuire picked up a yellow I think after 15 minutes, and Dean Rock he hadn't even got the slip on him. He just pulled the jersey back ever ever so slightly I would say, which is an innocuous enough foul because I've done it many times myself. And he gave him a second yellow. And all of a sudden he was gone. That was in the 38 minutes. And uh, Dublin had hit the previous three points before that, before half time, and were kind of coming. They hit four after Maguire sending off, got themselves in a great position. And then Lee Gannon was sent off as well, again, quite harshly. I just I just don't see, I, I, I you wouldn't see the colour of a card for the offences, like or anything, maybe even a tick comes Am I right in saying also that that play continued on, Dublin got a score, and then he went back and gave a yellow card? So, I mean, by right, if it was a foul and a yellow card, Dublin shouldn't have been allowed to, to continue playing and scoring. Yeah, I'd agree with you, but it's actually looking at it because you're kind of thinking, I actually thought the game was dead and buried, and it did look dead and buried after Maguire was sent off, but... Uh, 
his attention was was only drawn to it by the linesman, and he could see him as the play was going on talking to the linesman. So he didn't, he couldn't Fair stop enough. the play, he couldn't stop the play there and then. But again, that was another another point. I think they went five up, and then all of a sudden, Gannon was sent off. It was back fourteen on fourteen. Brian Hurley, who was brilliant, particularly in the first half, he kicked the point from play. I think that scored in nineteen minutes. And then, amazingly, they were back level a couple of minutes later. But the sending offs and uh, like James McCarthy was very close to getting sent off at the end as well. He got a yellow and then a foul. So he was ticked. Like he was one away from going off. Jack McCar- uh, Jack McCarthy picked up a yellow. Jack is back. Con- Conor Callan picked up a yellow. Like they were just flying around like confetti. It was bananas. But Desi Farrell said, like, listen, Desi is not going to, never going to rock the boat too much. But he said that both red, red cards were soft. Now, John Cleary, the Cork boss, went a little bit stronger. He just said, soft is being kind to it. If those type of things are going to go on the championship, I wouldn't think that referee will get many games up in the north if you're going to get sending offs like that. And both of them were fierce harsh altogether. I don't know, was there a new rule in today or whatever? They didn't seem to me like anything like sending offs. Uh, when the championship starts, it will be blood and thunder. Every game at the start of the league, there are soft cards and soft sending offs. And that was it today. Some of the decisions were a bit bizarre on both sides, but he said, I wouldn't be blaming the referee for the defeat. Can I just say what jumped out to you or jumped out to me after those quotes? Well, when he mentioned, um, I wouldn't think that referee would get many games up the north. That just right. jumped out. Did, did that not, did that kind of just jumped out to me? It was like, you know this, um, you know the way Con Kilpatrick was chatting last week about like almost being treated differently or something. Even yeah. like there's nothing to this. Like that's it's just because generally games are I don't know are is it tougher and more physical maybe up the north or it's more bruising. But again, inferences like that probably give some guys maybe a chip on their shoulder if they want to find something to have a chip on their shoulder over. Which generally people do want to find stuff to have chip on their shoulder over, especially I was in always GA. Told Shane to be as balanced as possible and have chips on both shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. So we had kind of actually, I'll just go to the comments first, and this is talking about Ross Common's great form. Ross Common did something similar in 2015-ish. They topped their game second in Division One. They really targeted and then collapsed come championship. So it comes with a warning. So that was when John Evans was over the team, and I, and I was at the post-match press conference. I think they'd beaten down the same day. And he was said, you know, uh, in terms of like the only way is up now, keep going and challenging the best. And I'm pretty sure it was Paul Keane, a uh, journalist. He said to him, does that mean winning all Ireland? And John said, there's no other way. Now, I'm sure if John could go back, he'd have done it slightly differently. But they didn't have a great championship and maybe the wheels came off a little bit. Am but I right in saying, would... yeah, Kerry Phillips had them in a semi-final, did they? League semi-final and they never recovered, I think. Was that, I think that was the same year? 15 yeah. or 16, I think, yeah. Yeah, um, delight for the new house common manager, real GA man. Great to see him doing well. And another thing I wanted to say in terms of Davy Burke having that late start, being over Maynooth, and he, I think he had a couple of Ross Common lads there, and he would know a lot of the Ross Common young players coming from, I suppose, just being around underage the last number of years with the Kildare underage teams, and then also um, just being involved in the Sigerson. He's going to know any good player coming through from Ross Common, you'd imagine. So he's able to fast track them through. But look, we'll come back talking about a couple of more of those games. Um, we did a poll actually, just in terms of like how many people thought it was a, a red card for Lee Gannon and how many people thought it was a red card for um, for Ian Maguire. I'll just bring it up on screen here if I can find it. Give me I a doubt, moment. I, I have a fair idea of what way the percentages would be skewed here somehow. Yeah, so no for uh, Ian Maguire, 93.6% say no. The Lee Gannon one, 66.4% said no. So that means a, uh, a third of people did think that it was actually a red card. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be one of those. It's just because there was like a, there was actually a bit of physicality involved in it. Like the Maguire mm. one, I've never seen somebody sent off for something like that. Like it was, it was so innocuous. It was ever so slight pullback, and Rock was delighted. Like he, he wasn't getting away from me, Maguire. I don't think, and he ended up having a handy free. And as I said, like the Dubs totally kicked on in that period, and we'll talk about it in a while. Cork did brilliant to get back into the game, but I just don't want to be seeing yellow cards and red cards when thrown around willy nilly. And realistically, we're not going to see it come summer, so we shouldn't really be seeing it this time of the year. And like you'd be the same as me, I'm sure. If they're warranted, like there wasn't hardly a big hit in the game. And you know, and you're just flashing cards around. Um Seamus Mulhair's probably put himself on the back foot, I'd say, a, a bit now because it's such a it such a high profile game. It was obviously the the big T V game yesterday as well. Yeah, wasn't there a few years back that um 
was it Paddy Nealon refereed a big game between possibly in the league between Dublin and Kerry and he came in for plenty of coverage afterwards from the managers if I remember so, someone watching the show might remember off the top of their heads but there's something to do with Paddy Nealon in a big league game I feel it was those two teams and it can put you on the back foot as a referee sure even look with John Keenan last year Give an exhibition referee in Limerick against Clare and then see a game for the rest of the year. Um, okay, so John Bubbles O'Dwyer has retired from Intercounty Hurling. And that's why we're talking about the top five risky hurlers of the 21st century. This is not going to be an easy list to do. Uh, but we'll try and get through it quick enough. We won't keep you here, here all day doing this because there's lots of big other stories to talk about. But who's coming into the conversation for you? Who's the, I cannot leave this person out of the list? Owen, Owen Kelly from Tim. Yeah. Yeah, um, so he's straight in at number one, fair enough. Uh, he, he's, I tell you, he's very, very high. Um, he won't be far off number one, I'd say. Uh, yeah. I remember he, hearing when he was growing up, I don't know who told him or some, someone told him to be doing, like he did heavy enough early, he'd be doing figure of eights, figure of eights, left hand, right hand, figure of eights. And you just see, look, I've not been smart, like me and you, uh, with the best will in the world, wouldn't have, been the, rich, wouldn't, have been the, wouldn't have been the riskiest, I know. Be careful what you say, buddy. <laughs> We definitely wouldn't be the riskiest. And then you've seen lads, we come up against lads and they're able to do like, you know, the the backhand tennis smash in tennis, you know, where they're able to go like that. And you see a lad coming in like someone Kelly, just able to flick a ball like that and generate so much power. Someone who probably won't be on the top five list, Shane, and you might know much about him. But Andy O'Brien from Waterford, or from Wick, uh, Wicklow, I should say. Yeah. Some of, the be- some of the best risks I've ever seen. He's a, he plays a bit of handball. I just remember a ball dropping dropping in around the square in a, a ring match and he just he just went like that just threw his hand at it like that flicked the ball and just flew into the net like fl- like he just brilliant wrists as well he's probably not going to make the top five but uh, is, what, is he Pat's, Pat's Greystones or Zero Pat's or? yeah yeah Pat's in, in Wicklow Town yeah outrageous wrists serious yeah. wrists I think I might have played against him in a challenge match a while back but um, yeah some, some good players in every county but um, Owen Kelly Keen Lynch and Joe Canning says Fergus Butler um, they'd be in the bracket. I mean, it depends on what you mean. So again, like yesterday, and I'm not for a second saying that he's in this list, but um, like Bonner Maher was playing in that t- uh, Dylan Quirk match, and like there's very few people with as good a first touch as him. Now he, he mightn't be the greatest ball striker in the world, but in terms of first touch, unreal. And I'd say the same about Keen Lynch. Unbelievable touch, unbelievable tricks, flicks, all that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure if in terms of risky striking, and he is a very good striker. If he'd be in my top five here. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree. Like I'd have Patrick Corrigan ahead of most of those players when it comes to risk. Like, and I've I marked him at close quarters one time. I remember being in on top of him in Tullamore one day, and he just literally just went like that and struck the ball forty five yards without rate. Like you just that's kind. Of, I think that's more of what we're talking now. If you're talking yeah. like. Bet you know most skillful player. I think is a different argument. Like Gerard Hegarty is obviously a class player as well. Would you say he's risky? Mm, I wouldn't say he's as risky as Owen Kelly or Patrick Corgan. I think that's maybe a different conversation. Would you put the likes of your Richie Hogan's in there? I would, yeah. You'd put, you'd put Richie in there, all right. And even just thinking of how risky that was, the goal against Cork a couple of years ago, and flicking kind of that reverse flick back, um, I definitely would have him in the conversation. He's obviously got that kind of handball background as well, where... You need to just think about how loose your wrist has to be and how strong it has to be to be able to play a sport like that off left and right. He obviously had that famous uh, that famous dummy hand pass back in the day and he was obviously able to hand pass the ball 30 or 40 yards as well. I definitely would have... I'd probably have... I'm just thinking like, TJ would be wristy, but would he be that wristy? Would he... I think Richie Hogan would probably be wristier. Is wristier... Uh, uh, I think worse? it is. I think, I think it is. I'm, today. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, Colin's English Dictionary might enter this in next year after watching this video. Um, where about what about Shane Dowling, Noel McGrath, obviously John Bubbles O'Dwyer, um, Joe Canning is in there as well. Dowling, uh, Dowling got that brilliant goal for an appearance, didn't he? Remember the block down and then the, the uh, against Shock Neil. Yeah, yeah, that was brilliant. Um, man, he obviously got that brilliant batted goal as well. Uh, I don't know if that's is that riskiness though. Um, do you know what I mean? What's the de- what's the definition? What's the Webster's definition? Webster's dictionary definition here. I think it's all quite spurious. It's 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 hard to nail it down. You just know it when you see it. It's it, no, actually, that's one hundred percent. It's hard to describe it, but when yeah. you see it, you're like, ah, oh, great hands, great wrists. You know what I mean? Yeah, just his lovely hands, lovely hands. Um, is there a so, greater compliment to an Irish person than to say 
they have grey hands. Oh no! And uh, uh, generally, the term down home I find is is uh, lovely hands rather than great hands. Oh okay, lovely hands. Yeah, yeah we'd always say grey hands. Yeah. Uh, DJ qualifies played at the beginning of the century. Lads, you need to define uh, Risty first. Matthew, we'd love to. Jason Ford, top of the list, says Boom Boom 43. Um, he is Risty. He is Risty, yeah, in fairness. He is Risty. Like, Noel McGrath would be very Risty as well, wouldn't he? Oh, he'd risk this all day for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just let me think. Here, look, what about this working list? How, how are you feeling about this? Uh, I'm not necessarily... Well, hold on a second list. now. Hold on a second now. Hey, look, so, I'm not sticking to it. I'm just saying that's what we have at the moment. The orange, you don't have, like, this is mad. I know you have a tip man up the top, so you're handy. But the, basically, the origin or the genesis of this idea came from John Bubbles, Rizzo, or Dwyer. I mean, you don't have him in the top five. Yeah, well, I'm not saying he's not in the top five. I just threw he's, down a few names haphazardly. Well, Bubbles is definitely in the top five. Is he number one? I don't know if he's number one. He's definitely in the top five, though. Um, Like, of, of the tip team, oh, yeah, of that generation that's come since... Oh, he's right up there. I still have Son of God up number one now, I have to say. <laughs> would you have uh, Bubbles ahead of Noel McGrath? I would, yeah. And would you have Patrick Horgan ahead of him? Can I just ask you here now, right? On yeah. Just on Joe Canning. Yeah. Are, are we talking Are we talking risks, like, when you think of Joe? Is, uh, is that the first thing? Or is it just that he's unbelievably skillful? Or would would Riss be the one that would jump out to you if you get me? I know what you're saying. I, I I think sometimes, like when I think of Rissiness, I think of a lad strikes the ball and it just absolutely takes off. And you know, like sometimes you see a golf player hit a shot and it takes yeah. off, and then after a little bit, it seems to take off again. So I, I do think he's incredible power in his striking. Um, I wouldn't put him ahead of Bubbles. And like even that Bubbles goal against Galway in 2016 was it? Yeah. I mean, very few people could score a goal like that. The bounce off the ground effort, yeah, that was brilliant. So that was that had, mm. was one of the main reasons to win the All Ireland. I probably would have bubbles ahead of. Um, I would probably have bubbles ahead of Joe. Now this is ML eighty nine. What he says there is totally, uh, he's totally correct. Canning's goals with Cork in 08, That was an unbelievable goal. Kenny Leinster final in twelve. Uh, but are, are they risky? You know, are they risky goals? I'm not. I'm not sure. Are they? You know, if you, it's hard to describe what we're talking about. Now, if you're talking about risk, what he's able to do, what is what is risk able to do from a line ball? Nobody has ever done it before, and maybe no one will ever do it again. Like I think we could still be talking in a hundred years' time that Joe Canning is like easily the best sideline taker of all time in the history of Ireland. I just don't see anybody. I don't see anybody surpassing what he's done. Okay, so that doesn't really help us narrow down there. You've sort of, you've talked a fair bit of rot there. I give you that. <laughs> you haven't really helped us out. Joe, I'm going to bring up the, wait now, given Kenny won yesterday, are they now back after beating Tipperary, Shane? That was in the Dylan Quirk match. Yeah, we get to that. We get to that, Richard. Uh, so this is where we're at now. Yeah, I just, I just can't handle having, having two tip men, one and two. Um, but just, who, who do you want to boot out? Just quickly, like, does Austin Gleeson come into this at all? I do think he's class and he's done some of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. But I don't know if some of that is, like, his athleticism and uh, his ability to jink and jive. Like, those two brilliant goals against Cork 2014, uh, in Turles 2017, the one in the All-Ireland semi-final against Cork also. Um, were they down to wristiness? And, like, he does have brilliant hands, but... I don't know if it's wristiness in the way we're talking about here. Like, he's a force of nature type thing when he gets going. Yeah, potentially so. Uh, Richard Hogan just says here, if you're talking about wrist, one who had serious wrists, in my opinion, was Cha. His ability to get power and distance with such a short swing was pretty amazing. Yeah, he did, he did a serious pair of wrists. Um, are we just... Anyone else in tip that we're leaving out? Just We just go to fly through the count. John Troy, now here, they we're talking about 21st century. He obviously did play in that All-Ireland semi-final uh, against Cork in 2000, where he did one of the uh, one of the riskiest things of all time oh. when he when he took the ball when he took the ball no when he took the ball off Brian Corcoran. Oh the, yeah, the, the the chop against Antrim would have been uh, would have been prior to that, but he definitely has to be in the conversation even for the couple of years. What about Paul Flynn Waterford? Yeah, I I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, like I, see. 
I, I think we're I think we're falling on more of what we're looking for now, though. Really, aren't, aren't we, though? Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like Flynn's wrist, like to be able to do to be able to do that top spin effort that he did that day against Cork, even, and to be able to disguise it so well. Outrageous, yeah. I de- I definitely have. We can't have a, a top five without John Troy in it, anyway. Like um, you but- know, one of the Antrim lads. Oh, it could be. Uh, it, it might be Sean Elliott. Someone will correct me. But there's a, one of the Antrim fellas. His nickname is Troy because he did some flick in a game, and that's the admiration that they have for uh, for John Troy up in Antrim. Matthew Landy here uh, makes a comment. Whenever someone mentions good wrists, the first name people may, uh, say is Bubbles and Owen Kelly. So I'd say one and two justified. Um, but if you're if you're putting Troy in, right? Did he do his best stuff in the nineties? Yeah, he, he he probably would have now at county level. To be fair, now he still qualifies because, as I said, that brilliant flick on Corkham was in two thousand. Whether he he actually might have only played one year in the 21st century. Yeah, I, I think on the basis of that, we'll take our get-out clause there. He's got serious risks, but I think we'll take our get-out. But does does who we just mentioned there, Paul Flynn, does he dislodge any of these? Uh, tricky one. I feel like we're... I feel like there's a couple more that we've left off as well. Um, there possibly is. I, I'm it, flicking through the All-Stars from 2000 on here. Um, and I'd, lo- I'd love, I'd love for the viewers, like even thinking of Kevin Broderick's point in all one, like how risky was that to be able to do that with one hand? I think he only he's one hand in the hurl the whole way around, and then the second hand only came on to tap over the point. Like Eamon Kennedy was an all star in two thousand. He never played for Kenny again after that day, and he only had two years with Kenny, such as the ruthlessness of Cody. Uh, he'd be in it. Jer Farrer had a fair oh. set of wrists on him. Eugene Clunan had a fair set of mm-hmm. wrists on him. Uh, mm-hmm. Paul <laughs> Kelly had serious wrists. So we're going to try and keep this. Like This is going to be a South Tip Award. Mullen the Horn, Kill It All, you name it. We'll get, this, we'll get the top three as tip boys. Yeah, you're actually upsetting me now making it about South Tip. And of course, Roma <laughs> guys made tip. But yeah, I don't, I don't want this to be focused around. We need to get some North Tip in here. Um, and I'm looking through some of the All-Stars. Like Andrew O'Shaughnessy had some great hands as well. Um, there's lots of players that would be in and around the discussion. I think like Owen Larkin, unbelievable first touch as well, and, and great skills and all that kind of stuff. Um, John Milan, obviously force of nature as well. Larry Corbett, very good wrists. Big Jeffrey, Mag- big Jeffrey McGonagall had a fair set of wrists on him as well, and was an absolute handful. Um, I remember Jeffrey telling me, "Ah, like brilliant, brilliant character." I remember him saying he was getting abuse from a play from a lad he was marking one day, and he put the ball in the net. He was like, "He says you're calling me fat, and you can't even get close to me." He said, and he just said the player just curled into a ball and retreated for the rest of the game. Um, he had a fair set of wrists on him too. Just think of anybody else in Galway in recent years. Really, when you're probably thinking the Canning is probably one of the ones that are higher up. Uh, anyone else in Limerick? Well, Boom Boom 43 says Ronan Maher and Tony Kelly. And like they're, they're like I think Ronan Maher can hit a sideline as long as he can hit a drive in golf. And uh, Tony Kelly's obviously an unbelievable player. But I think he's so predominantly powerful on his left-hand side. I don't know if that gives us an easy out to preclude him from the list. I think uh, the point on Ronan Maher is what you were saying there about somebody hitting a ball even out of their hand <laughs> and it just takes off and then takes off again like his like when he he doesn't even have to open his shoulders it is literally a flick of the wrist and it's a hundred yards which is kind of unheard of in the game really when you look at a lot mm. of lads who have to be on the front foot he can literally just flick his wrist like that and it, it just goes a mile so yeah I definitely would probably have him in around the conversation all right. whether he makes the top five now is another story yeah Stephen Bennett he has also got Great skill, great hands. Um, there was somebody else who came to mind. Aaron Galan, obviously very, very oh, tidy. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. I, like to do what he does, that flick over the shoulder. And it's funny, w- one of the things I'd remember on Kelly for most is like the ability to be able to score over the shoulder like that, to use your wrist. And Galan, you wouldn't say he does it off his right, but he definitely mm. does, does it off his left. Like he... Like Dottie Burke was in on top of him in that alert in semi final last year, and he was able to lean back and just use his wrists. Um, I'd probably have him high enough up in the conversation now, I have to say. So, again, now we're, you keep telling us that everyone should be in the list, but you're not telling us who comes out. So, do you want Paul Flynn in here, yes or no? The, 
there's not enough I remember to have him in there outside of the dipper. There's not enough I I can say I stand over it if you get me. Do you want Aaron Galan in the top five here? I probably do. Yeah. Ahead of who? Who's dropping out? Honestly, I'd have a, I'd have Galan in at number five, and I'd probably switch Horgan and Hogan. So canning out. That would be my opinion on. We're ta- what we're talking about is his wrist now. Yeah. Now I have to say I was just thinking myself I'd be swapping these two around. So Angolan, um well you see I think Canning is better has is more two sided. So I wouldn't be dropping him out for that. Okay. Um so he's done stuff, it over yeah. a longer period of time. Yeah, okay. Some of the stuff that Galan has done is outrageously risky. Um Well, you could say the same about Canning as well. Yeah, time. and it's uh, in fairness, the line balls left and right. That goal Go against Kenny in the 2015 Leinster final, the one that came over his head to catch it and then be able to strike it like that with such power, I'm not that, sure many could do yeah, that. Yeah, no, the goal against Clare in Turles as well, where David Burke passed it to him, didn't he take it one touch and bang as well? Yeah. Yeah. So are, are we then, okay, Adrian McGrath says, own Kelly tip, his strike off both sides was almost the same, canning out his nuts. Um, well, no, I, I, we, we've kept him in there. So are we happy enough that this is the list? Paul Kelly, John Bubbles, O'Dwyer, Patrick Horgan, Richie Hogan, Joe Canning. Tis a fair list. Tis a fair list. Keep the comments coming in. Let us know if you think we're right or wrong. Uh, but I'm happy enough to stand over that. Owen Kelly, John Bubbles, O'Dwyer, Patrick Horgan, Richie Hogan, Joe Canning. By God, if you had them all in the in the forward line. I'm not sure who's going to win enough ball for them to show off. Yeah, yeah. So we, my need God. Of, we need a couple of honours in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that was enjoyable stuff. Keep the comments coming in. Even if you haven't watched live, uh, let us know afterwards. We'd be interested uh, to see what you have your thoughts on it. By the way, we've mentioned Aaron Galan there. He lined out for Crees Celtic as they drew 1-1 with Broadford United over the weekend. So I'm not quite sure what that says because I'm sure Limerick, you know, this is an off weekend for Hurland. There was no um, league matches. You'd imagine they were either doing one of their usual training sessions in Radkeel on the Sunday morning or maybe they played a challenge match or an in-house game or something like that. So it's Hard to imagine that you'd play both a challenge match or an in-house match and a soccer match in the same weekend. But yeah, that was reported on Sporting Limerick that he played in that match there. Waterford Junior A Club, Turin. Uh, or, or, is it Turin or Turin that it's pronounced? T-O-U-R-I-N. Um, I, the two Fives brothers, they play for them, don't they? Yeah, that, they um, need, yeah. They're aligning with Premier Intermediate Club Capaquin due to dwindling player numbers. Uh, 22 players have officially left the club. With uh, notable player, notable players, and being yeah, the intercounty players, Gavin Fives and Dara Fives and uh, Shane Fives as well, of course, Pig Farmer. That is, I mean, that's tough going, but it is good to see clubs banding together like that rather than just you know players not having anywhere to play. Listen, it's probably going to be a more likely occurrence over the next while, isn't it? Particularly with with rural clubs, um, and I don't know if they're actually joined at underage or not, but. Listen, I think this is going to become a common, occur- common, a far more common occurrence. You'd have to say, uh, as much as clubs, uh, you know, don't want to die out and want to stay as their own entity, a lot of the time you probably have to, ma- you have to make a decision on it. Um, yeah, it's tough. It is tough because once a club joins, it's it's kind of two histories coming together, and you have to kind of make your own history, and it can be tricky and it can be divisive. With you know. How, what's the what's the the demographic or the dynamic on the board balance between the two? Who's going to manage the the added the main adult hurling team? Is it one from one or one from the other? Is it going to be joint? And there's like can be tensions and stuff there. But if you look at say Rathdowney Earl, uh, Clockballa, Collat, they're like two clubs in particular. In Leash, you Burst know, Cotton, Burst Kilcotton, Lockmore, Castellini, obviously, um, and la- the Castellini lads would be take over you call them lock more that's why whoever gets the first name in the amalgamation usually gets the better, the better of it um but yeah i think a lot of clubs are gonna to have to do this to survive yeah yeah it's just kind of the way of it and Unfor- it's an unfortunate uh reality that we have at the moment um i, ca- I can't but mention the the story that dj carey has received a settlement with aib or he's reached a settlement at aib through which a debt of over 9.5 million has been was written down to sixty thousand. there's obviously other extra details and all that but it's just one of those ones that sticks in the craw when you consider the really difficult time that everyone went through with the different recessions and downturns and and what have you 
Like, it's quite a story. And I really do hope that certain people are hauled over the coals over this because some people have been chased and harassed over debts that they might owe and then are right down at that level, a 99.4% write down. Oh, I just find that one very hard to swallow. Now, maybe there, there, I'm sure there are genuine reasons and all that kind of stuff, but it's still very, very difficult to swallow. Yeah, we obviously don't have all the, the facts on the table at the moment, and I don't know if we'll ever have them. There's bits and pieces coming out kind of here and there. Um, a lot of you know, a lot of anti-GA folk would be coming out and saying that within Ireland, if you're associated with the GA, why is there like, seems to be one rule for someone who's good at GA and nearly another rule for someone who's not. But uh, th- this is a bizarre story. Um that mm. we're only going to learn we're only going to learn more about over the next while um when all the facts eventually come out yeah um okay so the next story is a fairly sensitive type of topic um so i'm just going to read it out here hold on just give me one second just to find it because it's been moved around in our notes okay so transgender girls between the ages of 15 to 12 to 15 would be approved to play ladies football subject to an approval by a new transgender application committee so i'm just going to bring it up on screen here uh just to show you that there is an official document that's got out over this i think it's going to be one of those things i think we might i think we might have lost you shane there you might you might boot yourself out and come back in and i might uh i might read out this if that's okay i think your your internet is failing you there so shane was just saying there that transgender girls aged between 12 and 15 will be approved to play ladies football subject to an approval by a new transgender application committee so i'm just going to bring up the details of it here so this is the statement from this is a statement from lgfa Telling them on. Um, I actually don't have the statement in front of me, Shane. You might have it right there in front of you. Well, basically, we, I could go through the whole thing in in fine uh, with a fine tooth comb. But just essentially, the thing is, transgender girls b- between the ages of twelve and fifteen will be approved to play ladies' football, subject to an approval by a new transgender application committee. Now, it's one of these things. It's obviously a very thorny subject, and you know, in Ireland, as we saw throughout COVID, that if you have an opinion that goes against what is considered the orthodox opinion, you are cancelled straight away. That is just the nature of it these days. So what I'm going to do instead of uh, putting ourselves up to be cancelled by trying to give reasonable thoughts on this, I'm just going to bring up some of the replies when we put this up on Twitter yesterday. So first off, do you agree with this decision that this has been approved? And of the 1,018 people who have voted, 91.7% said no. They do not agree with this with this move. 8.3% said yes. So whatever you're hearing in the media and people who have been put up on uh, as spokespeople about this, does it necessarily reflect what the general person says? And they might say, oh, look, but you have a very specific type of audience. Well, this is a GA audience. It's a GA topic. And this is what the result is so far. So again, just to come back to some of the comments, Amy O'Callaghan, there's a very good reason why in smaller clubs, the girls who stop playing on the boys' teams at under 14, and that's called testosterone. In a matter of a few months, they fill out and become strong and aggressive. This is dangerous. Uh, Podrick McIntaggart says, no 14-year-old boy will play against my 14-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, wait until someone gets badly hurt. Any parent of a child between 12 and 15 that allows their child, uh, child to transgender should be locked up. So obviously, it's very, very, um, I suppose divisive topic uh people some people can't believe that it's real great to see and hopefully more to come says alan tobin one of the few people that seem to uh comment positively on this madness will cause serious issues so i think that's one of the things we've seen in american sports uh in recent times you have uh tran- transgender athletes who are competing in the likes of school wrestling and swimming and we it's one of these things that because certain politicians and media people and uh different companies want to promote it um, it's almost like that side is the only side heard and it'll go several years into this topic and then a big issue will will occur and we'll see that, well, this is really negatively impacting girls, then maybe a discussion could be had about it. But I think it's one of these things that it won't even be covered that much in media and then eventually down the line something big will happen and then it'll become a topic and you'll be cancelled for, for, you know, given the non-Orthodox opinion. Yeah, it won't be, it won't really, uh, like, this, this kind of flew in under the radar a bit, like, it was kind of left field and kind of obviously... But that's like, politically the way Irish media is, because this falls on the type of topic that Irish media tends to say, okay, this is generally acceptable, they don't cover it, because they don't want people talking about it, 
and giving an alternative point of view, or even just discussing it rationally. Like, yeah. we're not even allowed to discuss it ra rationally, which is why we just read the topics, not looking to get cancelled. So, make yeah. no mind. <laughs> yeah, you can't. It's the sort of thing, it's mad. It's mad that you actually can't really have an opinion about certain things and broadcasting. That's just the way, that's the way it is at the moment. But as you say, this will be front and centre in a few years, probably when something high profile happens. And... Yeah, and it was interesting to see that comment there. Like, yeah, like, girls always traditionally played with lads up until under 14. Then all of a sudden, like, lads take a big growth spurt. And it does generally get more dangerous, maybe at under 16, at minor level. And they tend to go and play ladies football or go into camogie or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's definitely uh, it's definitely topper walking anyway. And I think the, the, le the, the level and the percentages of our viewers that are totally against it is, you know, Quite eye, oh, eye, eye, eye opening, really. Like ninety one percent, and like that's you can say, yeah, it's a GA audience, but you know, this is a GA rule, and this is a GA country. Yeah, you know. Um, so moving on to the next topic, intercounty minor competitions would remain at under seventeen after a motion to return them to under eighteen competitions was defeated at Congress. Uh, the Kerry hurlers they're going to be admitted uh, automatic entry to the Munster Senior Hurling Championship should they earn promotion by winning the Joe McDonough Cup. 98.2% of delegates voted in favour of giving them the same automatic promotion as other McDonough teams who would go into Leinster. Um, so I think that's fair enough. I'm happy to see that as well. As long as Kerry are happy with it, yeah, I'm happy with that. A couple of things flew in under the radar here, Shano. Um, and I actually like this, that players are going to have to go back to the 45 for the throw-in in Hurland now. So Mark Keane's goal will never happen again. Mark Keane's going for Bally Giblin where he just ran in behind the ball, behind the throw-in and picked it up that way. That's going to... Like, there's a lot, there's a couple of things happened over the weekend that probably flew under, under the radar. This is definitely one of them. I think they're what they're trying to do is avoid that rook around the middle of the field where it's a bit of a lottery and the referee doesn't even throw the ball in between people. He just throws the ball anywhere and people just go running around. But the only thing it is about hurling, like... You wouldn't see it happen in any other sport. It's just the game is just a bit mad, really, when you look at it. There's so many mad things happen. And sometimes referees even play into that. But um the the two linesmen are gonna have some job getting everyone back to the 45 anyway, because it'd be a cavalry charge into the middle of the field. Yeah, and also uh, the Galway Club champions are now gonna have to go into Leinster. Uh, that was another thing that flew under the radar to some degree over the weekend as well. And um a friend of mine from Galway, he got on straight away saying that what if you're from one of the, and this is the same cop topic of conversation that the likes of Offaly and Leash might have with the Galway minor teams coming into Leinster is, what if you've just had a breakthrough county title win in, you know, one of the, the not strongest counties in Leinster, and all of a sudden you're coming up against St. Thomas's who are so experienced. But I'd say that's just life, really. We can't really have a team getting automatically into an All-Ireland semi-final, especially when, like, the Galway Championship isn't as, you know, incredibly strong as it was before when you've had Athen Rye and, you know, Port Omna at the peak of their powers and so on and so forth. So I think there's, I have no problem with this. Now I'm interested to see what they do with the All Ireland semi finals, though. Yeah, that's it, exactly. And there's probably a good few things that flown under the radar. The nature of the GA person is like uh, things come in at Congress, they don't really happen till next year. It's almost like the, the GA president as well. Jared Burns, obviously, is the, the, the next GA president. He's duped on tougher for the next year. But, like, he doesn't start till next year. So you don't really think about it until then. And then all of a sudden, next year comes along. So, what are they going to do with the Ulster champions? Is you know, is it just going to be an All Ireland final between the Munster champions and the Leinster champions? Will Ulster end up in Leinster ultimately? Um, are there too many teams in Leinster then? Um, when you have like within Munster, you're going to have you know five big hitters within Leinster. Then you're going to have Galway, Kilkenny, Wexford, Dublin, Offaly, Leash, potentially Antrim or Derry. Um, in there as well or down so yeah um, it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out yeah um, also Congress has approved that inter-county players can now play at under 20 and senior level but they can only play for one of those teams in any seven day period at least there's a bit, little bit of common sense going on now with this because it has like it basically ruined the under 20 championship for the last number of years I would say the likes of David Clifford and Shawnee O'Shea Shawnee Shea I should say couldn't play with their team and they would have definitely won that all Ireland back then imagine uh, to say that David Clifford never played under 20 and Sean O'Shea like they never got to play under 20 it's ba it's bizarre if you were mm. Cotton O'Neill you'd be particularly aggrieved here though wouldn't you the likes and your Oshin Peppers your Tiernan Killeens your, well, your, your do you know what? the Oshin Peppers are really 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 bad case list he came on for a couple of minutes and was ruled out do you know what I mean? Like that's you'd be really sick over something like that. 
And like, especially like even the managers of those under 20 teams, they, of course, have aspirations and they're putting yeah. in huge amounts of time, not to mention all of the backroom team, I should, I should uh, add. And then this is just taken from, ah, it's ridiculous. Uh, just in terms of Camogie, just 24 hours after Tipperary had taken the scalp of champions Galway, Clare ended an exciting open of the league by beating Kilkenny. Um, other notable results saw Cork beating Dublin, 317 to five points. We mentioned Paul Kelly earlier. Uh, he's over the Dublin team. Waterford had a huge win over Offaly as well, 422 to 19. Uh, the Fitzgibbon Cup final, that was on over the weekend. Let me just double check the scoreline there. But uh, Michael Kiley scored 4-1 for... Um, I mean, what a player he is. I don't know about you, level. Shane, but when I, I watch the clips of the, the UL versus SETU Waterford semi final, I'm just thinking, oh, there's no way that all the big hitters from UL can be kept this quiet again. And Mikey Kiley catches fire after scoring that brilliant goal to win the, the Fitzgibbon in, you know, was it deep into extra time or is it at the end of normal time last year? He hits 4-1 four, four the other day. Um, who were the joint captains? I think it was Brian O'Mara and Mark Rogers. Um, yeah, no, UL really, really turned it on from a from a NUIG Galway University of Galway perspective. They never really were able to get going. Really, now when you're hit with goals like that, you're always on the back foot, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, two years in a row to be the hero like that. That that's a brilliant buzz for um for Mike Kiley. Some of the other players who did the score, and Grodo Connor, he scored nine points. Tipperary. Uh, Grod O'Connor, one of those was from play. Colin Coughlin got a point. Uh, Brian O'Mara, Dara, Dara Corcoran from Kilkenny as well. So plenty of players stepped up and did quite well. Greg Thomas and, got a goal for uh, University of Galway. And uh, we probably finished. didn't talk about it much, Shane, but Reece Shelley was the UL goalie up until coming off in that quarter final. And I could say D Mason won UL the Fitzgibbon. Did you see that double save against Watford? Yeah. Oh my God. And then I think it was Brian O'Mara put over down the far end. And he had a picture up on Twitter uh, from a year ago. It was like Fitzgibbon in safe hands or whatever. He, ta he ta tagged Rod O'Connor and then they updated the picture a year later. St still, in, <laughs> still in safe hands. But uh, mm. uh, no, no doubt those boys are having a good time of it now. They had a good weekend. I was down in Parky Cueve yesterday and the UCC boys after winning the Sigerson were paraded around the half time. And they looked like they, had, looked like they were fairly shook anyway. Yeah, and I was in uh, I was in Ryan's and Camden Street the other night. I think it was Thursday night, and there was a lot of cheering about DCU. They were up in the platform on the back, um, on the in the smoking area. No, I wasn't next or near a smoke myself, but they're out there in the back, and they were giving it the big one, singing about DCU uh, on that small little platform. What do we want to talk about next? Uh, will we go into a few games, or you know, there's so many games over the week. Do you want to chat quickly about the Dylan Court game? You saw it. I didn't. Um, it finished Kilkenny 420, Tipperary 25 points. Just even uh, personnel wise, how strong were teams, maybe even in comparison to the league game the week before? And obviously, the kernel of the point is great money. I think the goods of 5,000 paid in, great money uh, made for the Dylan Cork Foundation. Yeah, and a lot of people would have paid for the stream online. I'd imagine that the jerseys as well, there were special commemorative jerseys, I'd imagine it to be a uh, fair bit of that going towards the foundation also match programs all that kind of stuff so i mean brilliant both from everyone involved in it the tipperary team the kilkenny team everyone involved in setting that up so fair play yeah, can i just say something shane as well like kilkenny and tip hate each other obviously but the the respect to realize you know when anything needs to be done the more than uh yourselves a couple of years ago they are if they all come together, there's a kind of a hatred, but there's a respect as well, you know. No, there is like it's it's the it's the best probably compliment you can you can put. And like Tipperary obviously wanted to play a team here where they were going to get you know as much publicity out of it, as many uh, bums on seats, and as many people watching. And you know it could only be Kilkenny when you want to when you want to raise funds like that. And fair play to both teams involved because they obviously knew it was going to be a bit weird in their calendar that they're going to play a really competitive game one week and then an exhibition game which is still competitive the week after but so uh a doff the cat to or cap to everybody involved there absolutely and fergal horgan was reffing it and yeah i think i'm pretty sure he had to give out the cards a, a few times so lads weren't fully holding back. i'm not happy about that now a temporary man in the middle for tipping kill kenny no matter <laughs> with the best will in the world it was 90 to 10 for most decisions i'd imagine yeah porter porter says it's all one way michael kill kenny hate tip 
Yeah, I, I, I don't mind Kilkenny at all. I think they're, that they're is fine. The, no, that is no way through. And I don't uh, like losing to them, obviously, yeah. but I definitely don't hate them. How, how um, many times over the course of this year you're going to talk about the eight year famine or something that Kilkenny have, or Brian Cody's five in a row, five years without winning? Seven in a row. Seven in no, a row. Yeah, uh, he was up in Ballycastle over the weekend as well, giving a speech. They were having a bit of a dinner dance, and Brian Cody was up there. Um, Kilkenny had a, had a, a pretty strong team. It was like Owen Murphy, Connor Delaney, Park Walsh, uh, Des Dunn, Connor Heary, David Blanchfield, Hugh Lawler, Connor Fogarty, Paddy Mullen, Paddy Deegan, John Donnelly, Billy Ryan, James Berg, and Martin Keown, and Grode Dunn, who scored a hat trick. So, this is the young Tullerone man, the left hander. He plundered 3 1 for himself. Massey Keown got 1 3. Um, and I'm very interested to see if. A little bit later on, in, like, will Garo Dunn step up? Like, he's only, he was a fresher this year. Like, mm. will he get serious championship action? Like, he's well filled out, young man. You know, put him in alongside Owen Cody, TJ Reid, Adrian Mullen. You know, what sort of forward line are they going to have? So, look, Kilkenny were miles ahead during the first half. I think it was 11 or 12 points ahead. Tipperary maybe had a slightly more of an experimental team. And I think there was plenty of the lads who probably would have been friends with Dylan who were starting. And uh, Tip probably brought some extra power off the bench and it made it far more competitive for the rest of the game. There was one stage during the first half and like you probably noticed as well, Mark Kyo seems to have fallen a small bit down the pecking order with Tipperary at the moment. But he was playing in the half forward line. I think from my view of it, he was centre forward for a lot of the first half. There was a period there where he scored five points in a row for Tipperary. So most, of them from, most of them from distance and most of them from on his right hand side from distance. And I would see him as be, you know, favour in his left hand side. He's a right handed player, but favours uh, what I can see striking off his right. It seems he's done an aw- or his left. It seems he's done an awful lot of work on his right. And I think he went on to score like six points quick enough with five of them coming off his right hand side. He got seven in total. So that's pretty impressive. Like that, that really stood out to me. If uh, like he's not a free taker, it's not often like how many times I don't know if you've, you've seen a guy even score three in a row from play. Like, it's bizarre. Even though I saw uh, Desi Hutchinson got, like, three points in 90 seconds the other day for MIC Turles, actually. Uh, but that's outrageous from Kyo, in fairness. Con did it the three in the space of, like, a minute and a bit once against St. Martins for us. That's, it's savage, isn't it? it, it yeah, it's just, maybe <laughs> Mark, 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 Yeah, maybe Kyo can maybe kick on now. Uh, we both think he has plenty of potential, anyway. Maybe this could be a bit of a springboard for him and get him. Maybe it'll also help him to get get a start next weekend or feature prominently next weekend as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that was that match and fair play to everyone involved, especially both teams and the amount of organisation involved would have been huge. So congratulations to everyone there. Uh, You mentioned MIC Thurless and TUD. So uh, the MIC Thurless won 17 points to 110. Aaron uh, Ryan, who was recently dropped off the Warford panel, he was uh, brilliant and he was man of the match in that match. Uh, scored seven points. Desi Hutchinson, he was quite good as well. Like you said, three points in 90 seconds. Shane Walsh was centre back. Uh, Leashes, Aaron Dunphy was centre forward and the others. And I think um, the college offers secondary school teaching degrees, so it could potentially become a new hurling powerhouse. So hopefully, because we want to see more success in Tipperary, don't we, Vernie? <laughs> I just think in every talk about Aaron Ryan, like it's literally just dropped off the water panel. Like Ryan issues come get me play. Do you know it's great when a lad is dropped or something like that and takes it kind of the right way. And I think I might be right in saying that MIC Turles were involved in a kind of a controversy last year. Did they end up out last year over like some weird kind of score difference or there was something weird. I remember them tabling an appeal last year to the Higher Education Board and it fallen on deaf ears. Coming, It was ca- kind of similar to the UL Ashburn Cup one this year, um, but they didn't get back in. So they obviously still have the vast majority of those players. So it's good to see that they got over the line at the weekend. Yeah, and a final hurling result over the weekend. Uh, Division 2A round 3, Meath 123. Donegal, 16 points. So that's uh, quite a comprehensive win there for Saoirse Bulfin and co. Uh, we start off with Mayo against Kerry in the Football League over the weekend. I watched this match on Saturday night. Finished 2.14 to 1.10. Brian O'Donoghue, he scored 1.3. Definitely took a couple of steps for that first goal, but a really nice improvised finish. James Carr with 1.2. The pace he brings to the full forward line, I'm wondering if Killian O'Connor is going to have a little bit of trouble getting back into this team. And also if Tommy Conroy gets 100% right at some stage heading into the championship, and hopefully he does. It's going to be seriously difficult to get in there. Jordan Flynn scored four. He's taken on a real leadership role from what I can see. He's a bit of a powerhouse, and he's very comfortable scoring. Seems to get in around the D an awful lot, and it almost seems like it's kind of, you know, definitely going to, he's definitely going to be popping her over the bar every time he gets in there. So they were really good. 
Kerry were disappointed. Like it was something like, oh, they were well behind at halftime, really hugely behind. David Clifford came on. His first intervention was to score a brilliant point. He scored three in total. Barry O'Sullivan scored a goal that was in garbage time near the end. But like, would you be bothered? Would you be worried now if you were Kerry losing two fourteen to one ten in in a match at this stage of the year? Yeah, you don't have David Clifford starting. Maybe other lads are only sort of getting back up to speed. Would you be bothered? Um, but the fact that the fact that they brought him in showed that they were clearly somewhat bothered. Like we talked about, I'd say we said round six or seven, did we? Are definitely coming on in round five game, and he's back yeah. after after round three. Probably shows you as well. Um, as good as you know the quality that Kerry have, they are a bit lost without him, and they were rudderless without him by all accounts the other night. Um, would you be a bit worried? Yeah, it was a bit of a, no, a non-performance. I saw a couple of things have happened already this year. They were beaten in Donegal, obviously, which they wouldn't have been happy about. They can see the five goals against Kerry in the McGrath Cup, and you can say it's only the McGrath Cup, but it's still Car- four. Yeah, it's still four more goals than they conceded nearly across. What well, three more than they conceded across all competitions last year? Um, they were poor again the other night. Uh, yeah, listen, they're probably are behind the eight ball a small bit in terms of what they've done in comparison to other teams. But yeah, you'd have to be a bit worried. Just on Ryan O'Donoghue as well. The steps one, I wouldn't be as outraged about the steps in that instance as, as others. I think he kind of fell in. He took the shot at exactly the right time to get away with taking the probably seven, eight, I'd say. But whatever it is, forwards just get away with it. That's just the yeah. nature. Of, that's the nature of the game we live in. It's a forwards world. Backs, if they took, if they take five, all you see is this. Forwards get away with absolute murder. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm wearing the Mayo jersey here. Go to orgoretro.com, Use the promo code our game, and you'll get fifteen percent off. Huge range of jerseys there. Uh, by the way, also want to mention that we've got the, we've launched our live club GA fundraiser. So this is going to be. We'll bring a show to your parish, and it's going to be brilliant stuff. Celebrity guests, quiz, fun challenges, local legends, the whole lot. Email events at ourgame.ie. So we're looking forward to getting going on those. Um, by the way, we will bring carnage to wherever we go. It will be. So oh, it won't nice. be filmed. Yeah, it, can't it won't be, be filmed. filmed. No, you ha- you're going to have to be in the room. Um, yeah, listen, me and you have been involved in a few live shows already. The one in Burr was <laughs> gas crack. Um, some great, great yarns, even. You think about them every now and then. I know Pook on was brilliant as well. And uh, yeah, we're going to bring the live club fundraisers on the road. And it's, it's a huge opportunity to cover a vast amount of your club costs all in one night that will never be forgotten by those in the room. And those that aren't in the room will never hear about any of it. Yeah, so <laughs> as we said... Go to uh, our email, events at ourgame.ie. And we're becoming a bit of a specialist in event management. We've got these coaching clinics coming up. One in Valley Rovers, Cork. That's March the 11th and March the 3rd. We've got one in Piltown, County Kilkenny. You can get uh, links to the tickets on the video description as well. So just check underneath the video if you're on YouTube. And there's links also on Twitter. So does anybody think that Mayo were lethargic in the second half once David Clifford and Sean O'Shea were brought on? They sent uh, ridiculous whites, committed stupid fouls, outscored 1-7 to 6 Maybe they tuned out a small bit. By the way, Aidan O'Shea was full forward. I thought he was quite good in this game. He didn't score, not that I remember, but he had a hand directly in a three points at least and then sort of a secondary assist on three or four more. I thought he was quite good. But I do wonder how many top teams in football have an inside forward closest to goal that isn't a huge scoring threat. Now, there was times, you know, he scored a hat-trick against Sligo one time. Remember that famous goal against Donegal? But he's not regularly scoring one three and one four, we'll say. No, I'm not sure how comfortable he looks shooting either as well. It kind of, kind of almost looks like he has the yips a small bit when he's shooting. He don't know how comfortable he's taking a shot. But as the creator, like he's been brilliant their last two games. Uh, looks like he has a bit of a new lease of life as well. And one player that we need to talk about who's been, who seems to have just, I don't know if he's been given a leadership role under Max Say or what, but he seems to be thriving as Jordan Flynn. Um, and his decision making is so much better now. I think he kicked forward the other night, did he? Um, just yeah. looks like a lad that's, sticking the chest out and uh, just really, really keen to drive the whole thing forward. And he, yeah, he was and brilliant again the other night. And he's some tank. He's an absolute beast, yeah, in fairness, yeah. yeah. And they need, the way they're playing as well is, like, they, they you know, they're still counter-attacking or whatever, but they need, you need a, a big athletic lads, lads like him to be able to drop back, get turnovers and be able to break a pace, maybe get a quick ball inside to Adonahu or whoever. Um, I think it's going to be exciting when Tommy Conroy gets back fully fit as well. And as you say there, um, it would be a luxurious position to be in to be able to spring O'Connor off the bench, wouldn't it? Luxurious. 
luxurious yes it'd be it'd be a luxury um, <laughs> uh, it would be a great position for them to be in and it also means that you know you maybe have someone like an O'Donoghue or maybe a Conroy inside who can yeah they're brilliant and dangerous up front but they can also track back and cover a lot of ground whereas O'Connor is probably at the stage of his career where he's probably not really able to do both effectively, if you get me. It's kind of one or the other. So if they were in a position where, if they were in a luxurious position where they're able, where they're able to bring him in with 20 or 25 to go and just attack and just score and let him be able to empty himself as well if he has to come back, that'd be that'd be great for him, a great for him to stay. But yeah, you have to be say, from my own point of view, we talk about Kerry and how maybe off colour they were. From my own point of view, Last good, like they haven't been, they're not, they're unbeaten yet, you know, two draws and a good win against Kerry. Yeah, so Tyrone have lost two of their three games in Division 1 so far. Galway have a win, draw and a loss. So they, they beat Tyrone this weekend, 16 points to 13. Matthew Tierney was excellent, he scored six points, three of those were frees. Uh, Carl Sweeney, he was very good, he scored three and plenty of other lads stepped up. Darren McCurry scored five, three of those were frees. But did you see that bomb he scored on his right foot from 35 yards? He's a player that has, like, one of these players that over the years has gotten better and better. I don't think I, I can remember from his early days him scoring a point with his right foot from any sort of distance at all. But this one, like, he looked really natural on his right foot. And you would think of him as predominantly left-footed. So I was very, very impressed with that. Yeah, and the predominant left-footed players across any cause are usually, like, very predominantly left-footed. And the right foot is usually for standing. And up until a couple of years ago, he probably would have been like that. But it's a great it's a great string to, for him to have to his ball where lads are going to show him to his left. And they'll say, if you're, able to, if you're able to kick it off your right, fair play. But I'm playing the percentages here. But that was obviously a great score yesterday. And, yeah, he's the sort of lad... You know what you used to say about Shane Williams, the Welsh rugby player, that he'd, you know, he'd, get, he'd evade a tackle in a phone box. Like, McCurry's the same. He needs very, very little space to operate. Um, I love watching him in full flow now, I have to say. Uh, he's just really dangerous. Even his runs in behind. I think it was Chrissy McCaig picking him up last year when they played. I think he did. And it was just, remember someone had a video from behind the goals and it was just cat and mouse between the two of them. A brilliant man marker against a guy who's brilliant at creating space. Um, if Tyrone are going to have a good season this year, I'd say McCurry will definitely have to have a big season and McShane inside, beside him, will have to have a big season as well. Disappointing for them though, because they got a good result last weekend uh, against Donegal and weren't really able to back it up realistically against the Galway team minus their top three inside forwards in Finnerty, Walsh and Comer. So you'd imagine Dewar and Logan wouldn't be happy with that. They would have been expecting to get a result. So a couple of things there. Shane Williams, by the way, speaking of brilliant players and whatever, just as sort of a thing, any player who thinks that you reach a certain, a certain age and you can't improve, he set his best ever 100 meter time at the age of 33. So if right, you think yeah. That, yeah, if you think you're getting long in the tooth, Fear not, you can still improve. And a lot of people actually think you can't get faster. You actually can. You definitely can. With the right um, with the right approach, the right S&C, athletic development, whatever way you want to put it, you can improve speed. Another thing is, we're talking about Darren McCurry being a little bit two-footed. Who's the best two-footed player in football? I mean, we've got a fair selection with Shane Walsh and David Clifford just at the moment. But does anybody else come to mind when you think of two-footed players over the years? Would we um, even get a power rankings out of it? <laughs> we probably would. Down to like Matt Connor was ridiculously two footed, he would have been outrageously two footed. Um, just trying to think of the predominantly forwards, really, that you think of, aren't they? Um, Kevin Cassidy was scored that bomb against Kildare off his left, but was generally right footed, wasn't he? Am I right in saying? Um, Kevin Cassidy, Am I right no, he scored that with right? his left, yeah, he but, he was, but he was generally right footed, wasn't he? No, he couldn't be more left footed. Was he left footed? Absolute really? nonsense yeah. of the highest order. No, it's not it's just, uh, it's, just poor, it's just poor recall, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Just, I'm very surprised. Re Normally you'd really? be less stupid than that. Really? That's Yeah, that's surprising now, yeah. Massively left-footed, yeah. Um, Dermot Connolly, at times, did some great stuff with his left foot. Yeah. yeah I would say Bernard been, Brogan yeah. became a very good left-footed finisher as well. Now, generally, he was closer to goal, but I think he became quite proficient. Just thinking as well, yeah. Gooch is brilliant off left and right, was it? Yeah, there's some of the real good inside forwards, and the three we've mentioned are probably Clifford, Gooch and Walsh, that it's of no difference what side you show them. Like, the percentages mm. of them missing don't, don't decrease 
uh, or increase at all. There must be a couple more in recent years. There must be another double. Go again. Anyone, anyone from Throne? Peter Canavan? Was it in his locker? He scored. Uh, he scored the great goal off his left, didn't he? The the, mug, the Muggsy catch way for the hand pass, and that yeah. was off his left. Um, Morris Fitz so, says Richard Hogan. Morris Fitz scored. I never forget that. Remember, he scored the free off his left under the Hogan stand against Mayo in that the Morris Fitz final in '97. Remember that? It was out, I think he kicked nine out of thirteen points. Yeah. What a, what a guy. Uh, okay, if anyone sees uh, that topic or has come in late, keep the comments coming. We'll, we'll come back to it a little bit There was a comment above, Shane. I think it was Dennis Noonan uh, wanted Declan Hannon in the conversation for the best risky hurlers. <clears throat> he yeah. is pretty darn risky. Yeah, he's he as risky as anything. And measure, like, if, when you look at it as well, that point to draw or to put it's the one blood in him, of course. The final. Yeah, listen. Who are you taking? You're taking By the way, so does Keen Lynch. Irla Daly. Carrock Daly, you'll take anybody, anybody you can get. Well, like you think about it, most good hurling in Ireland can be linked back to Tipperary in some way, shape, or form. Next topic, please. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Park Joyce said after the 16 uh, point 13 win over Tyrone, second half, bar the first five or six minutes, we were very pleased with the rest of it. The way Tyrone came back at us, it looked like they were going to draw the game level or maybe go ahead with a goal chance, but our lads pushed on and got six scores in a row. We all know Tyrone loved to over, uh, turnovers and live off that. They had three in the first five minutes of the second half, but I don't think we gave away any for the rest of the game. Monaghan beat uh, Donegal 120 to 15 points, and Donegal were ahead by about four points during the second half. But Monaghan completely took over. Jack McCarran and Darren Hughes were back for their first league starts and both were very good. McCarran got seven points. And actually, there's a guy you talk about being very predominantly left-footed, but he scored a beauty on his right at one stage, turned his man and clipped it over from about the 21. Uh, Connor McManus, he came on as well. And um, he was involved in a couple of um, advanced marks, which he converted. But big, big blow for Donegal because Paddy Carr, manager, confirmed that Paddy McBrearty would be out for the foreseeable future uh, with a hamstring injury. This is uh, like you don't need Paddy Carr didn't need any bad news at this stage. This is <laughs> the last thing he needed. And uh, just to go through some of his quotes here, so he said, as you said, for the foreseeable future, he says that McBrearty is going to be out. Well, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, the injury is a serious enough injury, and it will necessitate surgery. He's going to be out for the foreseeable future. The season is not ended far from it, but we've got the best medical advice that the best option for him is surgery. So that's going to happen very quickly. Paddy's a leader and a figure head but what do you do I know uh, a lot of teams are dealing with the same type of thing but like of all the teams that didn't need a big player to be injured Donegal and their captain who obviously was quiet the first day but still kicked that winning score like he's the last player they need to be missing right now Um, so yeah and listen I don't know too many minor surgeries on your hamstring I'll put I'll put it to you that way I, I, like, I, I would see that being longer rather than shorter yeah, generally something like that, you're going to be able to rehab it, build up the areas around it so that it kind of help take the load. So you'd, oh, you'd be you'd be worried for him. Porter Porter says it's going to be a good Connacht football championship. I think so as well, because we've already talked about Mayo and Galway and Ross Common getting their third win of the season this time against Armagh. 8,000 people there, give or take. I think it was not far off 15,000 at Mayo against Kerry. Some of the attendances at these games are absolutely brilliant and it's great to see and just kind of rams home again. This is GEA country. But, um, you know, as good at all as Ross Common were, deep in injury time, Keith Doyle prevented Reen, Reen O'Neill from scoring what would have been an equalising goal by cynically pulling him down as he raced in on goal. Got the black card, got appreciative claps from the home fans. Uh, they felt it was uh, the crime was certainly worth the time. Fair play to Keith Doyle, says David well, Burke. Yeah, what do you think? Like, Of course it was. He made a good decision at the right time. I think, look, every other team is doing it, so why don't we? So yet again, I'll come back to it. You have to give a penalty for a cynical foul anywhere on the pitch because they're only ever done to stop goals and it will stamp it all out completely. And people say, well, on the other, on, if it's on the end line at the other end of the pitch, yes, because players won't do it back there. It only ever happens if it's to stop a goal scoring opportunity. Like, it would never be intentionally done otherwise. Very fun, very funny. I was I was on that stag in Edinburgh at the weekend, and there was a load of expert boys there. And uh, one lad says to me, "Said I, I'll try and do it in the best of expert actions." He said, "I don't know who's worse, you for printing it, or Rory Jacob for saying that a penalty should be inside the sixty, anything inside the sixty-five. That's queer, man." He said, 
That's quite that, that wasn't a bad accent. Now, you kind of dipped in the middle of it, but not bad. Fair enough. But there's that Wicklow and Wexford as well. They're, they're fair queer hawk accents, to be fair to them. Yeah, yeah. And, there's, some, there's some great little isms. Queer is like a real yeah. Wexford, a real God. Wexford word. Yeah. Um, all, all, another thing as well is a lot of Wexford lads seem to be surfer type dudes as well. And they've got the long, like Lee Moog McGovern had the nice blonde locks at one stage, Jeremy O'Keefe as well. Do you know, they, they don't mind their bit of style down there in Wexford. No, they don't. It's a country country. False advertising says Gwelgore. It certainly <laughs> is. This is GEA country. Yeah, and it, it'd be more specific as well. Like, like your own county anyway, and Kilkenny and others. You should be, there should be massive signs on the way out saying, in particular in certain counties, that this is hurling country, let alone GEA country. Um, so Gerardo Gracon says, Is it not proof of how daft the structure is that only one of the top three Division One ranking team, or sorry, one of the top three ranking Division One teams will be able to qualify for a provincial final and earn top seed in the round robins? Ah, uh, sure, it is a bit mad. <laughs> yeah, look, province has got to go as far as I'm concerned. Derry beat me. This was in Division Two on Saturday evening, it was on TV, uh, 215 to 17. And Derry, I think the goal came after 40 seconds for Ethan Doherty. Um, and fair enough, like teams do concede early goals, but that's no real reason for me to capitulate as I felt they did throughout this match. Yeah, they kept it going a little bit, but they were very, very much on the hind foot throughout this game. And you know, some people would say, geez, bringing back uh, Connor Glass and Ethan Doherty very, very quickly after their uh, exertions with Glenn. But the momentum that Derry have had in the first couple of games, now maybe they can't sustain it for the rest of the year, but three wins from three, score difference of plus 26. It kind of shows you why he wanted them back in because I think Rory Gallagher just wants to hit the ground running this year and that's what's happening. I think so, Shane. I'm just trying to get through their fixtures here because I'm just seeing they play Dublin. Uh, I think they welcome Dublin up to Derry. That's obviously a huge game. But now both of them are really on the front foot in terms of like they're both three from three. No Cracker of a match, it. isn't it? Yeah, that's going to be a belter of a game. Here's one for you. If you're looking at like a potential All-Ireland, like, no, I don't even know if you call them a bolter, but are, like are Derry are Derry a tiny bit ahead of Armagh on what we've seen even this see it's a funny one Derry obviously won Ulster last year they played a different style you'd say you'd imagine I'd imagine uh, things would be a bit more free flowing this year a bit more attacking a little maybe less negative as it was in that uh, All Ireland semi final against Galway when they only kicked one six and only had one add up at different stages but. To me, it looks like they're getting better and better and better. And the, the Glen lads have come back absolutely hungry for road. And um, I just think, I think, I think they're a fascinating prospect going into an, an open All Ireland year, an open enough All Ireland year. I think they're a fascinating prospect, I have to say. Yeah, for me, like this is a bit of a bump in the road. They'd had two wins beforehand, they'd been looking quite good. Um, so they'll have to come back from that because really and truly they were completely outplayed. Uh, we had skipped over Cork beat, or sorry, losing to Dublin by two points. So it was 210 to 18 points. This is the game you were at down in Parky Cueve. What a save from David O'Hanlon laid on from Brian Hurley. Cork, of course, it was 14 men aside. And I was thinking, geez, there's not a lot of space here. But of course, the fact that both teams were down to 14 aside would have opened up that bit more space. Now, you probably had a better view even. But what a turn from Hurley, who gave an exhibition in the game. He scored eight points, four of those from play, three of those were, or sorry, three frees in a mark as well. But some shot, some save, off the, out of the, off the crossbar and back out. Now, at times you'd hear that the Cork support isn't really that behind the footballers. Was there, was there a big support there for Cork and were they vocal? Yeah, there was a decent support there. Um, there's a lot of young lads beside the tunnel that booed the dubs on the way out to the pitch. Um, Hilarious. Uh, yes and no. If I was a parent, ah, if I was a parent there, uh, if I was a parent, like I don't know if there was parents around him or something, I'd be going mad anyway. But that's just my own opinion. Um, there was a decent Cork support there, Shane. To be fair, um, there was a good Dublin support there, but as it should be on home soil, there was uh, a lot more noise for the, for the Corkonians, and it looked like the game was really gone from them. They got back in. Matty Taylor, I don't know what it is about that left footer, that left footer going through. It's very similar to, it's at the opposite end of the pitch, uh, but Owen McLaughlin's goal for UL last week into Sigerson, and then this was at the other end, and the other side just came across, and Taylor actually treaded through a lovely ball to Chris jo Chris Oak Jones, who hand passed through for McSweeney's goal in the first half as well. A lovely two brilliant goals, goal. weren't they? Yeah, brilliant goal. And they had about, as I said, they had five goal chances. They could open the dubs a couple of times. Now, uh, Fitzsimons, Mick Fitzsimons has been able to handle nearly everybody down through the years. Like, 
But Brian Hurley is one that's given him um, real trouble. He gave him real trouble last, was it last year in the All-Ireland quarterfinal. He gave him real trouble the other day as well. Key Murphy ended up in on him. But he was unmarkable at different stages. And as you say there, like he conjured a shot from nothing, really. I um, mean, you have to fair play to David O'Hanlon. He pulled off a great save from Jones earlier uh, in the first half. And then he pulled off that great save at the end, too. Uh, but the dubs a bit were opened up um, a lot more than they would have liked now. Definitely an awful mm. lot more than they did it. No. And like Stephen Sherlock had a real off day and went off early. And Hurley just needed um, a bit of a foil in there. Uh, particularly in the second half, he needed some sort of another attacking threat. He probably didn't really have it. I'd say Desi Farr was a relief man heading back up to Dublin last night because they really, they were hanging on. Like, they were just hanging on at the end. Uh, went into, I think it was seven minutes of injury time uh, listed. I think they played eight and they'd just be happy to get out of there. They haven't, like, the Dubs haven't, they were good against Limerick, like, but Limerick's results would suggest that they're maybe a bit out of depth. They weren't great against Kildare. They were all right yesterday. Um, obviously got Jack McCaffrey back in the pitch. Um, I think he'd been, he hadn't had a competitive match for Dublin since the 29th of February two, in 2000. So, a thousand. In, in uh, 2000? 2000, so, 22, 22 years. 2000, 2020. Uh, 1,087 days off. But it, it'll show you, um, you know, the depths that Dublin needed to go to. They had to bring in Jack McCaffrey yesterday, who would look to have lost none of his spark at all. I know he was only on for 20 minutes, but he he was he should have been offloaded the ball for a goal chance, and he kicked over a lovely point at the end. And it's bring on James McCarthy as well um, in the second half too. So they kind of emptied the bench, and they were just they just wanted to get out of there with two points. I think they'd be delighted that balancing act of bringing back the old stagers, as Desi called them, and getting them game time, but also blooding new faces. Um, of the new faces, Darren Newcomb kicked two points um, in defence. Impress, impressive enough display from him. I uh, wouldn't say there was a whole lot of other new faces really stood up and put their hand up and said, yeah, pick me come championship time, no either, you know? Yeah, and I thought Stephen Sherlock was a little bit off kilter with his shooting normally he's so oh, yeah. good but it didn't, didn't quite happen for him as well uh this time Carlo Mahoney he's got a bit of an injury woe as well Fintan O'Toole he was tweeting earlier uh that he's to undergo a scan today on a hamstring injury after last week Sigerson Cup finally previously missed 10 weeks in 2021 with hamstring injury John Cleary said doesn't look good at the moment but we wait until we get the uh, definite answer back so he'd be a big loss and I wonder like he was with um he was playing club as well going into you know, hurling championship was not with Bally Gibbon, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Very busy, yeah. Yeah, so on the go. Surely mentioned for Sean Quigley getting a last-minute goal to beat Inform down by a point at the age of 30 plus plus. Another two-footer, I think. Yeah, really good. Um, I was going to say, what's the opposite? Of, what's the football version of a sticksmith? Well, I'd never refer to someone as a sticksmith. Would you? Well, yeah. You'd call no, someone, you were, if you were doing a written report in a match, you'd say... John, John Bubbles O'Dwyer, the killing all sticks, mate. Would you stop, yeah, I would. Like? <laughs> I would, yeah, 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 I definitely would. And I definitely refer, in an article, when I was working back in the Star back in the day, I definitely wrote an article once referring to his Rolex wrists. Uh, well, that's okay, but sticks, mate. You're happy with story. that, okay. I remember, I remember for uh, one of the papers in English, like I'd never refer to like Heaney or WB8 as a poet. It just referred to him as a wordsmith. It was just the word that you had to get in no matter what. Yeah, so why can't we have a sticksmith? No, I'm, uh, no, I don't, 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 don't like a stick man is fine, like great stick man, but sticksmith. <laughs> ah, come on, it's not bad at all. It's like the way everything is gate, you know, it's like water gate, uh, Vernie gate, you know, Semple whatever. Gate. Like, yeah, Semple gate, you know, we, ha we have that sort of crack. Uh, golf gate, uh, division two back to there, uh, Claire 15 points, Kildare 60. So Ben McCormick had been lost to a second yellow card. But still, fourteen men Kildare outscored Clare by eight points to one, and this is this is a precious two points as well because Kildare have not been impressive up to this point, and their like their score difference is still minus thirteen. So that'll just tell you how comprehensively they were beaten in their first two games. Uh, Jimmy Highland scored four. Neil Flynn scored four. Also, uh, Owen Cleary he scored eight for Clare, so they'd be very disappointed with that. And in terms of the table, Kildare, they're down third last, just ahead of Kildare. They've got two points, so one win from two games. Uh, next fixture then, Loud. Just on that, Shane, like, yep. from a Clare point of view, 
like they're usually old hands, real experienced, you know, are able to see out games, games that they should be winning. Um, they generally do win, maybe aside from that Limerick game on penalties last year. They'd be, I was just chatting to one of the lads that was at the game there yesterday. Like they just sat back and invited Kildare on to them when Kildare had the breeze at their backs by all accounts when they should have been like they were in such a good position. It's an awful, an awful lead to lose. And they really could have stuck a nail in Kildare's coffin. Kildare would have been on four, Kildare would have been on zero. Now there's a potential that that result could really come back to haunt Clare later in this series when maybe they're trying to fend off relegation. Like they would have been, like they would have been half safe if they, if they'd gotten four points on the board yesterday. And you know when you have the foot in a, 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 a team's throat like that, like Clare were, as I said, like they were staring into a bit of an abyss. And now all of a sudden they've turned things around. I think Daniel Flynn came on. Um, kicked a, a late score, um, which was crucial as well. And he's so crucial to them to have that X factor up top. They don't really have a player like that. A player again, he's pretty left and right footed as well. In fairness to him, he'd be pretty two footed when we're talking about players like that. Like it's really all the really gifted, like the cream of the ta- cream of the crop. Really, lads that can do anything off either foot. But I'd say Glenn Ryan is one was one relieved man leaving Ennis yesterday because if you'd come up to him with fifteen or twenty minutes to play. I don't think you would have got words out of him anyway, somehow. <laughs> Do you know, um, when I was young, because of being a bit OCD, any time I kicked the ball with the left foot, I then kicked the next one with the right foot. So it became fairly much the, the two feet were as strong or as weak as each other. doesn't matter what they way you want to They were as bad as each other, but, yeah. Yeah, but I showed up at, uh, I, was, I was out of training there the other night, and there was a Gaelic football there on the ground. And there was no one really around, so it was a size four now, so you know, this wouldn't suit the, the bigger gent. But I said, you know what, I'll have a, have a pop here from 30 yards. By God, she was closer to the corner flag. I just haven't played enough football last had you boot? Had your boots on? If you, I find with football, I if you have runners on or trying to do that in football, it's a waste of time with that big ball. <laughs> your, your feet just go from underneath you as well. Uh, Pure Hatchet said, hurling is a stick, man. Football is a baller. So if you're a wristy hurler, are you an ankly footballer? No, most, most definitely not. Um, I, it's been such a compliment to say you're a stick man. Good, grey hands, lovely hands, and you're a stick man. By God, what about a metatarsally footballer? <laughs> and people well, dancing for. Uh, it's not going to get easier for Clare. They have to play Derry and Derry. Cork won't be easy. The Limerick game will be crucial. Missing David Tuberty, another two footed baller, says mm-hmm. Richard Hogan. Uh, Louth 115, Limerick 113. So Louth, they're flying it now, and Limerick, they're winless. So, uh, Sam Mulroy, he scored. Sam Mulroy, he scored three, and Darren McConnell, he was also very good as well. Six, and they had six unanswered scores after half time. So uh, Tipperary, this is Division Three, losing fourteen points to one nineteen. So that's three games in a row that Tipperary have lost. It's really not going well. Obviously, the injuries are there, but for Andy McEntee coming down to Semple Stadium and getting the win was big. He said in the Irish News it was comprehensive, but could have been more comprehensive. We went a little bit slack at the end, but at the same time, for a team that hadn't won this year so far competitively, it was important to get across the line. We're starting to put a better performance together, although we could argue that the down performance was better than that there tonight. Now, they'd only lost late on against down after leading well. There were bits of tonight that were very good, but there were bits that were still average enough. We conceded four or five points at the end when there was no real need. We had possession and we got a little bit casual trying to flick balls up. Times like that, you win the ball, you win your free, you kill the game. Make sure you don't give a team momentum. Uh, we had a mention of Sean Quigley. His 73rd minute goal as for claimed the spoils against down, 2.14 to 3.10. I'm sure Conor Laverty would be very frustrated with that. You might take us on to the next few results. Yeah, he definitely will be because they got a really good result against Antrim the last day in a high-scoring game. Antrim have been only kicked, uh, was it 11 points? or uh, uh, Paltry enough tally against Offaly the first day. One, was it 217 the last day? 119 yesterday against Tipperary. The huge tallies they're putting up. As you said there, Fermanagh had a good win over down. That kind of shakes things up a lot. Kavanagh are now the standard bears in Division 3 with three wins from three. They beat Longford with the minimum of us. Finished double scores, 119 to 11 points. So, Cavan's push for back-to-back league promotions continues after a facile win over over Longford. Uh, the Breffney boys made a three victories from three uh, after... I think they were leading one nine to five at the break. Goal from Ushi and Brady, and then they kicked on. And yeah, I was kind of a bit, fe- bit fearful for Offaly going to Westmead yesterday. I thought they were going to find it hard to get a result. So after Westmead been really poor against Cavan the first day, they're back on four points now. So veteran sub Kieran Martin proved to be the match winner for Westmead against Offaly. Um, 
although they were flattered by the six point margin by all accounts. Um, so I think you have Westmead on four, Offaly on four, Down on four, Cavan on six, Fermanagh on four as well, Longford on uh, Neil Poir under under along with Tipperary, along with Tipperary. Yeah, Longford are minus 37 scoring difference after three games. So it's been a tough run for them ever since winning the O'Byrne Cup. Uh, Division 4 then, the Wicklow Footballers, they chalked up their first win of Division 4, beating London by seven points. Uh, so that's a big win for Oshin McConville and his crew. Sligo beat Waterford 21 points to 13. Effie Fitzgerald, who's the manager of Waterford, said afterwards, Waterford football right now isn't in a very good place. It's very difficult to get guys to commit. Uh, that is why there's fantastic, fantastic credit due to the lads that we do have in the squad. Carlo, uh, one sorry, two eight leash one seventeen. So leash, they were five points behind, and they turned around uh, this game and won it. They seem to have the hex on their neighbours, and there's obviously a, a bitter rivalry between these two counties. So there was ten yellow cards, two to leash, three reds, one to Carlo, and uh, a red to a Carlo official didn't help either. So nine wides for uh, Carlo as well didn't help them out. Wexford they beat Leitrim by nineteen points to fifteen. A late surge there. Five of the last six points saw them win that fairly entertaining game at Chadwick's Wexford Park. Any other thoughts there before I go and ask you about the old <laughs> ghost <of> the week? <laughs> yeah, you've, you've definitely caught me on the hop again. Anyway, but uh, just if it's Charles comments there, like it's kind of funny, like not been disrespectful to Walford football it's just something you don't think about that much you know it's, it's such a the focus is so much on hurling within that county and like any any foot like Daisy Hutchinson was in playing football before he played hurling but any guy that has a sniff at being around the Walford hurling panel it's gonna go and play hurling uh, and by all accounts they'd, they'd been calling in some guys maybe uh, within Walford that hadn't been playing even with their first team are in you know not guaranteed starters on their first team, so definitely looks like they're they're not in a good place, and like it doesn't look like it's going to get any better, even though they are down the the bottom division. Yeah, so let's let's talk about your old goats of the week. I'm going to give it Garo Dunn for the hurling for getting that hat trick. Yeah, Mikey Kiley. I think Richard Hogan had me teed up there. Mikey Kiley four like four one like that's like something he scored in an under twelve C final, and he scores it in a. You know, a Fitzgibbon Cup final after we man of the match the year before. Um, and he's, I tell you something, Shano, he loves that double F, doubled effort as well. He's got another one again the other day. He's just brilliant at it. Um, and he's, he's a player that potentially Watford could be building a forward line around. I'm sure that's what Davy Fitz will be hoping in time. Yeah, Bernie's goal is Mike, Mikey Kiley, says Richard Hogan there. Um, I'd give it to. For the football, I give it to Jordan Flynn. I thought he was exceptional over the weekend. He was brilliant. I only saw the highlights of that game, so I, I go for a game I was at. Uh, and actually, Brian Hurley was brilliant for Cork, but David O'Hanlon much probably uh, underappreciated and not maybe taught taught about that much. Evan Comfort's obviously probably their first goalie, but he pulled off two brilliant saves, and that that one from Hurley where he tipped it onto the post was essentially the match winner. And let's see in terms of just the comments. Shishkin Verney, Ryanair Gold Cup. What does that mean? Uh, Shishkin bounced back at the weekend, was a two mile horse and won over two and a half at the weekend, delivered a brilliant display. The Gold Cup is over 3 2, the Ryanair is over 2 5. But the, it, it, I put you this way, Shannon, this is the best way to play in here. Very loud, 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 loud. Turn it down. It's very loud, isn't it? Very loud, yeah, very loud. Yeah, you actually can't hear anything. I don't think anybody can hear anything. It's like. Um, the Gold Cup is the cream of the crop. Going for the Ryanair chase would be like like putting all your eggs in the basket for the league. So which which would you go for? You go for the Gold Cup, wouldn't you? Oh, but of course. There you go. Um, yeah. I'd say he'll, I'd say I'm coming to hand for, nicely though for the Gold you, Cup. You, you are coming to hand, but there's doubts about whether you're a stare. I think you're a non stare Oh, I'd be a stare, all right. <laughs> um, just a reminder, World Code, our game, you'll get 15% off. We're wearing these lovely little jerseys here as we're showing off. There's a great selection there on the website. We do have the live uh, GA club fundraisers. If you need to raise money for your club this year for whatever the expenses might be that you have, get on to us, event, events at ourgame.ie, and we'll look after you as well. We'll bring a great show to your town. It will not be recorded because it will not be suitable for reproduction. Uh, coaching clinics that we've got coming up. We've got one in Valley Rovers on March the 11th, Saturday morning. Pat Ryan, Brick Walsh, and Michael Fenley are going to be there. We've also got one in Piltown, County Kilkenny. That's coming up the 3rd of March. Barry Hennessy, Park Mahoney, and Richie Power as well. So look at that for a serious lineup, Michael Burney. <laughs> Unbelie so Unbelievable lineup, yeah. Um, and I, I can't wait to get these fundraisers moving. Uh, we're going to have some crack on the road. 
We absolutely will. Okay, folks, thanks for joining us. If you want to get the audio podcast, it's on patreon.com forward slash our game, along with an awful lot of those extended coaching clinic videos. Thanks very much, Michael. Cheers, channel.